Hi and welcome. I wanted to try this video thing, so let's give it a go. Just an old electronics video blog, JF blog, ah, something like that. To start, I wanted to do something simple. I got this DIY keyboard kit, so let's have a look at it. Go over the schematic, as this will hopefully be an electronics channel after all, and build it. Now, the keyboard kit I got is the Lumberjack. It's an odd but interesting keyboard. It's a 50% keyboard, so there's around 60 switches in total, and they're split in these two sections. The electronics are neatly visible in the middle, there's some plexiglass that goes over it, so you can always see what makes it work, which I think is a really nice look. There are a few keyboards in this style, uh, the plate and discipline for example. Now the kit is open source, it's not available at the moment I think, but as it is open source you can download the files, order the circuit boards, order the parts that, need, that are needed, and still build it up if you want. Now, to build this keyboard you need a few more things than just a circuit board of course. The parts, as I ordered it on a kit, it comes with everything you need. I also wanted to use USB-C and I got the, that as well. Now you'll need some switches of course. I'm going with these uh, bubble gums. They're nice and pink and they're linear switches and fairly silent so let's see how that goes. Now, you also need a case, of course. I'm going with this aluminium one I got from AliExpress. Um, it's aluminium, it sort of matches the color of the switches, I guess. So, yeah, let's see how that looks when it's done. Now, you also need some keycaps to put on top. It's not really comfortable typing on just switches. I got the SA Bliss set that I already had laying around. Uh, again, gray and pink sort of matches the black and pink aesthetic of the circuit board in case. It might look nice, it might look like a horrible mess because of the few shades of pink, so I guess we'll find out. Now, with all that said, let's move this circuit board aside and first have a look at the schematic, see what um, makes it work. And here we go, the schematic. As this is a fairly simple keyboard, uh, it all fits on one page. There's no RGB or wireless or anything like that, so it's a really simple schematic. Uh, you've got a microcontroller section over there and the switches matrix over there. Now, the microcontroller used here is the Atmega 328, well known for being used on the Arduino. Now, the Atmega 328 does not have a USB peripheral. You'd need the Atmega 32U4 for that, with the U being for USB, of course but uh, that's not available in true hall. There are not really any true hall uh, microcontrollers with USB available. Well, at least not a lot. So how is this solved? The USB is clearly connected from there to the microcontroller. Now, there's a software stack called VUSB, which implements USB purely in software. It emulates the peripheral parts completely in, in software. The reason that this is possible is because a keyboard is a fairly low data device. Even if you're typing at record speeds, the amount of data you're generating is really quite low. So let's go over that and see how it's all connected. First of all, the USB connector or the USB supplies 5 volts, which goes to the microcontroller here. But USB itself, the data, at least for USB 1.1, uh, runs at 3.3 volts and not at 5. Uh, higher speeds uh, like USB 2.0 and newer need even lower voltage levels on these two pins. Now, as the micro is being is running at 5 volts, you do need some level translation. Now, this is done by these two Zener diodes that clamp the voltage at 3.6 volts maximum, which solves this uh, issue. Now, USB needs a fairly stable clock signal, so an external 60 MHz oscillator is used instead of the internal one of the Atmega. Furthermore, a few switches for reset and boot are placed, some LEDs to indicate caps lock, for example, some decoupling caps, and on the USB side, there's a fuse for protecting in case there's a short circuit, and these two 5.1 kilo ohm resistors. These, together with resistors in a cable, determine how much power a USB device can use. 
So that's all the um, microcontroller uh, stuff. Let's then quickly move to the switch matrix. As this microcontroller really doesn't have enough pins for all the switches, they have to be arranged in some kind of matrix. Um, they are arranged in a 10 by 6 matrix in here, meaning that you just need 16 I.O. pins instead of the 60. So that saves, saves quite a bunch. Now, how this works is quite simple. A voltage is applied on the column pins here, one by one. So first on column 0, then column 1, column 2, etc. And if a switch is pressed, the microcontroller reads the voltage on the row pin. So if, for example, this switch is pressed and this switch is pressed, first the voltage is applied on the column 0. This one is pressed, so row 0 is high and the rest is low. After that, the voltage here is removed and applied to column 1. This switch is not pressed, so row 0 remains low. Row 1 becomes high, uh, row 2 stays low, etc. And it does this really fast, going over all the column pins and reading out all the switches. Now, one thing that's interesting to note is all the diodes here. Uh, what they do is they make sure a voltage doesn't go back up. Um, let me explain. For example, if this switch is pressed, this switch is pressed, and this switch is pressed. Um, first column 0 will be uh, high. Voltage will go through the spin, making the entire row 0 high. Now, if there's a diode here, no voltage goes back up. But say that instead of a diode, it was just connected directly. Voltage will go up via the switch, go down via this switch, which is also pressed, and make row 1 high. This means that when column 0 is high, the microcontroller will think that this switch, but also this switch, is pressed. Now, the diodes make sure the voltage doesn't flow back up, and you can just press as many keys as you want, enabling and key rollover, how it's called for keyboards. And as these diodes are a really cheap component, there's really no need to not place them. Now, that was enough theory for now, I think. Let's move this aside and go for the actual building up part of the keyboard. Now, let's solder this board. Um, as all the electronics will be clearly visible, I like one of these um, bendy tools to make sure it just looks nice and tidy. You use them by just putting the component in there, bend it over, and you'll get the exact same bend every time, and it just looks much neater on a board like this. Now. It's always good to start with the lower components first, so if you flip it over, uh, stuff doesn't fall out as easily. So that means the diodes, the zener diodes, and the resistors first, then move up to the capacitors, uh, etc, etc. So, yeah, let's do that. For the diodes, of course, make sure that the black round hole thingy goes um, towards the correct part of the circuit board. Polarity matters for these. So, put them in, flip them over, get some soldering wire, and um, yeah, solder them in. Now, I won't bother you with all of the diodes, so it'll take a long time, so let's just fast forward through that. Oh, well, that was all the diodes and resistors. Most of the uh, components are in place. Um, let's move on to the capacitors and that uh, USB connector over there.
Now, the USB connector goes on the other side, so um, make sure it's on the right side. I uh, messed that up. Let's quickly solder that and uh, move on to the next components. The USB-C connector can be a bit finicky, so make sure to check that with a jeweler's loop or a microscope if you have it. Now, that's uh, most of the components done, so let's uh, finish it up with the uh, parts left. And there we go. All components except the switches, of course, are soldered. Uh, now's a good moment to hook it up to a computer and uh, use an online tool uh, like Keyboard Checker to see if the switches work. You can uh, test them with a small jumper wire or um, some tweezers. So let's do that, see if uh, I messed up and uh, if so, how badly. Now, of course, putting in the microcontroller does help. So. Don't forget that. Now, let's um, see if it works or not. I soldered in all the switches, and now it looks like this. I didn't want to bother you with any more soldering at this point. I'll go and assemble it in the case now, and then we can have a look and a listen to the finished uh, keyboard. And here we go with everything in the case and installs, looking quite nice in my opinion. Let's throw on the keycaps and uh, see how that looks. And there we go, the complete keyboard build. I think it looks uh, quite smick. Uh, it'll take some getting used to typing with this because, well, the layout is uh, completely different from what I would normally use. So I'll try and type a bit, see how that goes, and uh, you can hear how it sounds. It's uh, quite muted, very, very silent. It's, uh, yeah, there we go. One keyboard. I'll try and use this for a while, see if I can actually get used to it or not. Um, I hope so. It is nice and uh, small, and it's also, even with the aluminium case, it's uh, fairly lightweight, but feels sturdy enough. So, thanks for watching, um, and perhaps uh, I'll make more videos in the future, depending on uh, how all of this goes.